Fritz Leyland, and I'm a graduate student here at UC Berkeley. My primary interest is in how cells move. So I'm interested in, in both amoeboid motility um, as well as flagellar motility. So Naglaria is a single cell eukaryote. It lives, uh, we think, most of the time as an amoeba. But when it gets stressed out, it can become a flagellate. So basically it makes two structures equivalent to sperm tails. Um, and it sort of streamlines its structure and it can swim away. Nigeria amoeba uh, are sort of elephant tusk. They're just sort of clumping around. And then they become these flagellates that are super fast. So um, it's pretty exciting because you go from something that's really slow and um, ugly to moving, I think. And then you get these things that just really remind you of Tinkerbell. And so Nigeria can be found in mud. Um, sort of wet soils all over the world. So if you take pretty much any sort of wet mud soil sample, you can probably find Nigleria in it. The Nigleria genome is 41 megabases, which is pretty small for a genome, but it contains around 16,000 genes. So that's about two-thirds the number of genes in the human genome. So even though it's a real small genome, um, it has a lot, a lot in there packed in. Another way to think about it is if you can imagine a tiny dust particle that you can barely see, that's about 50 micrometers. So it would be, a, it would be five times smaller than the smallest fleck of dust you can imagine seeing. I'm Simon Prochnik, and I work in Dan Roxar's group at the JGI. My real interest is using um, code to compare genome sequences and the proteins that they encode to try and answer uh, interesting evolutionary questions. In the first half of the, the first decade of this millennium, there was a great interest in sequencing genomes that could give us a real insight into biological questions. But one of the most important uh, transitions in life was the um, evolution of eukaryotic cells, the cells that have a nucleus and mitochondria and so on. These are little compartments inside the, the cell. and um, because Nigleria is so far diverged from humans and plants and other um, species that we know about, um, it allows us, the genome sequence allows us to, to look back in time and try and uh, model what the ancestral uh, eukaryotic cell might have looked like. I think one thing that uh, all of us were really surprised about is Nigleria seems like it has the capacity to make hydrogen. And this is very interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, Firstly, any kind of system that can be used to make hydrogen is a potential, a potential interest from a bioenergy point of view. And second of all, um, the environment that Nigleria lives in, the, these kind of muddy soils, can be very, very low in oxygen. And so the, the organism shows this um, me metabolic flexibility in that it can survive in environments where oxygen is plentiful just as easily as it can survive in environments where oxygen is either completely absent or nearly absent. The one thing that's come out, I think, for all of us from, from looking at what genes Nigleria has is that a lot of the pieces for what makes an animal an animal and what makes a plant a plant were already there in these single cell eukaryotes. And so they have a, a lot in common with, with us and with plants and with other kinds of eukaryotes that um, are bigger and multicellular.